so she's such a blessing. So it's really more of an open discussion. So when I first started at Spring Arbor University, I started to notice some things. And it's one thing to have a conversation with someone. It's another thing to back it up with research. So what I wanted to do, and I have started to have a passion with bringing awareness with multicultural and um, diversity, but one of the major things is that only 1% of universities can keep African American female faculty, full-time faculty. So that means you're hiring us, but you can't keep us. And all accreditation bodies, especially with the human services and k prep say you have to intentionally re to recruit and retain diverse faculty. So what I want to do is discuss um, some of the things I found and then give you an understanding of our story in order to move forward. So I had a wonderful introduction of a paragraph which we do not need to read. Um, <laughs> it is in the printout if you want to, but it's basically talking about academic institutions and we want to strive to recruit uh, diverse faculty. And diversification in the classroom is um, an experience, but there are also some other things that we need to pull from. Um, it does seem like universities are unaware of what's going on with African-American female faculty. And I'm going to go back and forth between African-American and black. And I'll eventually go to black really quick because African-American takes a lot of black to say. Um, so part of the objectives is to foster a dialogue about race and multiculturalism within higher education. We teach it, but we do not want to talk about it for whatever reason. Um, to raise awareness of racial stressors within the classroom. Um, to discuss microaggression, to share light of black female professor, professors' experiences, and also discuss solutions of the retention rate of faculty of color. I think once we begin to uh, talk about what the research shows, then once we know what the problem is, now we have to work on a solution. So this is actually taken directly from the U.S. Department of Education um, National Center for Education website. And this is actually a graph of showing you um, the total of academic rank and whether they're uh, female, male, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Pacific, Islander. So, um, and this has been updated since 2015. If you look, white male predominantly um, have uh, the professor positions, associate professors, and then it goes to white female, and then it's black male, and then black female is the cross, and then Hispanic and Asian specific, uh, specific, Pacific Islanders, they're even smaller. So just to see, you know, sometimes we're visual learners, just to see the breakdown, you know, you may see a few faculty but of color, but um, it's far few and in between. So one thing, is that we often question as black female faculty is, why am I here? One thing is African-American faculty make up 6% of full-time faculty. And that is United States statistics. If you break that down, only 2% of that are female, African-American female. I pulled up 2009, and that is actually a 1.1 increase since 2009. So it's not really a, a great increase in full-time faculty of uh, black women. Now, we can't just say, hey, hire African-American full-time faculty. We have a problem. There aren't enough uh, qualified participants. There's only 7% of doctoral candidates um, that are getting their doctors and they're African-American. So how do you um, have that diversification within a university if we're not getting our doctorates. But then you, you do break it down a little bit more into master's degrees and just the, even the education within the inner city. Is it quality um, for us to um, retrieve our degrees? So another thing is maybe I don't belong here. There are a lot of things, and I'm, I don't know why I put those little, you know how you. You get special and you do the special effects, and I should have done that. Um, <laughs> so, the research showed that African American women, women felt a lower rate of acceptance. Part of that reason is because we're more likely to be challenged and questioned more in the classroom. And even though Spring Arbor is a Christian university, I do find certain students that they challenge me more. Um, I've even had a student tell me that um, I didn't know what I was talking about while I was teaching. 
So what do you do in a situation like that? You know, are there rules and regulations put in place to, you know, help us feel accepted? And it says that we're less likely to become tenured or the process takes longer. Now, some of the research says, you know, we have young children and um, the process just takes just longer than other races. So I think that maybe that's something that, you know, Spring Arbor, we can begin to look into um, as far as the retention rate, because the purpose of the presentation is to shed light and then let's do some research and see how it applies to our university um, versus going to every other university and doing research with them. Um, one of the reasons why there's a low retention rate is that excessive new course preparations. But I think that's just with any new hire, because people don't hire people because they have uh, excess you know, we just wanted extra people. We hire people because we, we need to put you in those positions. So we hire you and then we say, here's three courses, rewrite them. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, trying to balance it all, uh, maybe having a mentor. And one of the big thing is there are three types of racial microaggression. And one is micro assaults. Micro assaults are just saying the racial slurs. And that does happen in the classroom. It has not happened in Spring Harbor. <laughs> but it does happen in the classroom more often than you would believe. Um, then you have micro insults. Those are, they only hired you because you were black. I've heard that. Not because you're qualified, not because your resume is well written, it's because we needed black people. Um, and then micro invalidation is, let's say I have a situation, and I come to you with that situation and you say, well, I don't think it was like that. That's taking away, you know, my experience. So you have a, let's say you have a student. They say something, actually I've heard this too. It is, they try to be sympathetic, which they were insulting. Um, the particular student, because I'm African American, I talk loud, I'm robust, I'm flavorful. Um, so she said, I know you're not from here. Trust me, I get it. Um, and I could get it could be a cultural shock, but you're really loud. Don't worry, I've been to Detroit before. It's a cultural shock for me. So that threw me for a loop. You had a lot of different things that you, you assumed I was from Detroit. You assumed that I had, I was in an area where I was not familiar. And then she also told me she lived a privileged life. So you assumed that I was not a privileged individual. So how do instructors deal with that? What are we supposed to do? What's put in place, you know? What are the actions that come after that? Because we know the reverse of that, if an instructor said something like that to a student, okay, the provost will be there. So what, what happens when it's the reverse? Where's our, feeling of accepted. So it's like, after a while, you get a feeling of, maybe I just don't belong here. So then that's why the retention rate is 1%. I'll go somewhere else. But then it's institution after institution after institution that have the same things. Oh, that's when you're in one of those artist moves. Um, <laughs> One of the things is that teaching evaluations are usually lower with African American female faculty. So with knowing that, maybe us as a university, we can begin to look at the faculty evaluations to see if it is a little bit lower. Um, research has shown students consider African Americans less intelligent than white counterparts. That's just supporting the um, microaggression in the classroom, the you don't know what you're talking about, or this is how I've heard it, or this is what, I mean, you get a lot of different things. I've just finished teaching an online class and I had one student probably emailed me twice a week, every week, until the end of class. And just questioning things, or even things within the African American community, we um, respect people's position. So it's not hello, Julie or Denise, it'll be Miss Denise or Professor Morgan. So I always introduce myself as Professor Morgan. And majority of my students, uh, especially the uh, students of color, they understand, okay, it's Professor Morgan. But there are students that refuse to call you by that. I've gotten emails, hello, Tizana. 
and I'm like, hello. And then I'll, Professor Morgan, and they still do it. And this particular student, the whole six weeks of the class, never once called me professor. So then we look at coping strategies. Now here's the thing. It actually is a quote. We just play the game. We go into the universities. We do what we have to do. We change things about ourselves in order to deal with the racial stressors. So um, this is me. This is me. But this is not me in the classroom. Here's my students. I don't dress like this in the classroom. Because it could be intimidating. I've actually heard, oh, you're intimidating. And I, I'm not rude, I'm not disrespectful, but it's just a presence. When I first started at Spring Arbor, I used to wear suits. I remember I would wear my suits and I wore my heels and I have my makeup on. And I remember getting a phone call from the director at the time and said, the student said that they are intimidated. They said you're not rude, you're not disrespectful, but they're intimidated by you. Well, with me knowing the research about African Americans, I stopped wearing heels. I stopped putting on bright makeup. I stopped wearing suits to class and my faculty evaluation shot the roof. So these are things where Denise, I love my Denise, she didn't even know this. She knows us now. <laughs> she had no idea. She had no idea. no idea. But you know, that's keeping the secret. You know, the other black professors, we know about it, but how do we make a change? There's a fear. Um, we also seek support outside of institutions from other faculty of color. I've called colleagues from other institutions crying and asking, is this the norm? Is this what it's supposed to feel like? And I've heard this, yes, and it's not going to change. This is how you deal with it. And you move forward. Okay. What we do in the classroom is we use racial stressors as a teachable moment. We create and maintain a safe environment for our white students. We think about how the students are going to act and then we kind of reword things and we, you know, tiptoe around certain issues. Um, we set the tone for multicultural conversations. We set ground rules. We have non-reactive questions. And sometimes we have to establish the authority within the classroom. So let's say, um, what was it, week two or three in the intro class, we were talking about white privilege. You. We were talking about white privilege. And it was a hard conversation to have because there are certain individuals that do not believe that there is white privilege. So think of all the things that are going on within the news and African Americans getting killed and being pulled over by the police. And you know, there are individuals that say, I don't believe in white privilege, it doesn't exist. I don't identify myself with that. And those are hard topics to teach. So we actually prep ourselves. We set different ground rules. Sometimes we go into the classroom and we say, hey, are we saying black, white, Caucasian, African American, you have to you know, set the tone and say, hey, I don't want to seem offensive. This is only my story where my white counterparts, they don't have to do that. Because if I come off a certain way, I'm the angry black woman. Oh, we know we made her mad, I'm the angry black woman. And it's not even that. But our stories are different. Now, what I like about Pittman, Pittman has done a lot of research. He said taking the passive approach has been proven to be ineffective. Because I change everything about myself doesn't mean that the problem is solved. And us as human service professionals, how do we go to counseling sessions and tell everybody to address the issue, talk about it, or even as Christians, when God says if you have a problem with somebody, you go to that person and then we change everything about ourselves and we don't let the institutions know. So, me, I say, that's a little bit cowardly of us. Address whatever it is. If they don't know what the problem is, I can't fix it. And that's the truth. If I don't know what the problem is, I can't fix it. Now, once I tell you the problem and you don't fix it, then maybe it may be time to go somewhere else where you know I'm hurt. But a lot of institutions really don't know. So then accrediting bodies, they say, you have to be intentional about retaining diverse faculty. But if you don't know what's going on, there's not, you don't know how to be intentional about it. You don't know to look at faculty evaluations to see different things. You don't know to have like a diversity and inclusion committee that really talks about these diverse issues. You don't know to have a check-in with your, um, not just first-time faculty, but um, African-American or any faculty of color to see, hey, how is it? Because as the, the chart showed, majority of institutions are primarily white. 
we're coming in a different field and we have to adjust ourselves to make the majority comfortable. See, I'm coming here and then we're gonna talk. So this is what I wanted to end with a bang with. Multicultural competence must first start within the institution. In the classroom, Faculty stress the importance of being culturally aware to minimize offending our clientele. However, that same sensitivity is not emulated in the workplace. Colleges and universities alike should begin to examine the classroom dynamics, evaluation scores, and begin to dialogue with women faculty of color. A working understanding of their perceptions is the first step to eliminating the problem. Minorities in America have faced racism in epic proportions, and it has trickled into the higher education system. Avoiding racial issues within the institutional system will hinder diversification in the classroom. So now the floor is open for questions. Let's have a dialogue and a discussion about these things. So my question for the crowd is, did you know that this was going on within the institution and all institutions? No. What was it like to hear that? I wasn't necessarily surprised to hear it. It's true in a lot of other fields as well, but it's still, it's still shocking. I, didn't, I, didn't, I wouldn't have guessed that it was that systematic. It is. It really is. And when you go to different conferences, you'll notice that, you know, the African-Americans are sitting and they're talking and they're, or, you know, like, is this the norm? What do I do? How do I change this? And it has taken, for me to do this, uh, one of my colleagues, Pam Elmore, She's really the hardcore advocate. I love her to death. But she was like, no, you need to let everybody know. Because if no one knows, how do we make a change? How do we make a change? Or even like there was an email for a sabbatical a couple years ago. And I wanted to go to the sabbatical. I think it was in Howell. Howell has the number one largest KKK community. So that's where when we're talking multicultural competence, I'm not going to Howell for a sabbatical. I mean, it would be a sabbatical. I would be in the room locked and just stay there for a while. But even different things like that of understanding where you're sending, you know, faculty and the different resources, is it a friendly area? But the truth be told, if you haven't walked in the shoes, you won't know. That's, that's really the truth. If you haven't walked in the shoes, you would not know. Um, me being black and knowing people from Howell and they've said different things, I'm like, yeah, you stay over there. I'm gonna stay here. Okay, any questions? Yes. I have some questions and comments. Paul, uh, first comment is we are trying, I don't know to be formally met. I'm Kimberly Rupert, I'm the provost. Yes. Uh, but we are in fact trying to move away from the reliance, particularly uh, out of the science on uh, student evaluations yeah. because they can give you some some indications but the extent to which we relied on them to evaluate faculty is disappointing yeah, okay. yeah. so we're, we're trying to put in place down through the, the chairs and, and uh, peer evaluation but not just evaluation mm -hmm. but but visiting among the classrooms so we can all improve whatever the issue is yes, yes. so we're trying to put that in place because there are, there are real deficiencies there the second thing is there is a reality that some of our students are, um, I was the ombudsperson person of American Express Company for a number of years. We dealt with issues arising in 130 countries around the world. And uh, there is such a thing as an equal opportunity jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear about that. <laughs> and, and frankly, some of our students are along those lines. Yeah. Some of them need to be redirected for other reasons. But, yes. uh, uh, and, and we do try to find out ways to intervene. Unfortunately, the way we usually find out we've got a student who's a problem child is they complain. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, so if you have some suggestions about how to uh, assist faculty who are dealing with somebody before it, it escalates, that would be helpful. Uh, in terms of, of email courtesies, uh, that's, that's a problem. Uh, and, and I think it's appropriate, frankly, to call people on it. Uh, we do have we do have some faculty who actually 
will write back and say, you know, it's Dr. So-and-so. You must be addressing one of your friends. So since this has been misdirected, I will not respond. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now that, that's a little bit in your face. And yeah. you don't do that until you're ready. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, it, uh, frankly, to some of our students, it doesn't even occur to them. Or, or if it does, it doesn't register deeply. Okay. Um, especially because of the K crap uh, feedback that we received. I'm, I'm interested. At one point, uh, when you talk, and I wasn't sure whether it was microaggression or, or uh, when people say, "Are you here just because you, you know you're filling out the minority quota?" Okay. The thing that struck me about the K-Crep comment around intentionality was you guys are doing it right, but you're not doing it intentionally. Right. And, and, <laughs> you know, and my immediate reaction was, is that bad? Yeah. Uh, and so that's the first part of it. But the second part is your comment about specific elements of intentionality. I thought that was very interesting. Are, are we, in fact, looking at issues like um, uh, the, the evaluations and whether there are some bias uh, trends in there and things like that. So if you have some more ideas, I'm, I'm sure that the department as a whole would like to have some input as well yes. as to um, intentionalities, not just uh, let's go out and fill our quota, but, but how do we really um, build, uh, recognize impediments to the kind of community that we want to have yes. and then yes. take action in that regard. And I think the, the biggest thing is right what you're doing right now is saying I support you. And there is a fear within the African American community because you, you do what you're told or you lose your job. We've seen it for years. Like, so, you know, even in Christian institutions, I've seen where if you don't do what you're supposed to do and don't bark too loud, you're going to lose your job. So we just stay quiet and don't say anything because at the end of the day, we all need our, need our jobs. But to hear, you know what, you can reply back to that student and say, it's Professor Morgan. But it's Dr. Morgan. That is, I mean, the Provo said it. So, <laughs> you know, that's the ultimate, you know, support. But there are different, you know, ideas that even K. Krep said. They said, you know, with the community where we are in, do you let your African American students know the different resources that are available to them? Because you know, we go to different hairstylists. So, do you pull the different hairstylists within the community and say, hey? You know, we want to partner with you at Spring Arbor, you know, because it is a different area. Like my Flint students and my Detroit students and Lansing and Toledo, they're all different. So to have those resources available to them, because I still have Detroit students, I'm not their instructor anymore, but they still contact me. Like, I know that you understand it, you get it, you get the journey. But the fact that you're willing to listen to it is the biggest step ever. But how in the world is, is our community to benefit of what you have to bring to bear if we don't listen? That's true. Um, That's true. I do have a different question, though, and I apologize. I didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think, uh, ironic though this may seem, what you're describing in terms of the progress of, of uh, African American female uh, uh, professors. Yes is very parallel to what was going on in uh, the transition of women executives in business about 20 years ago. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and you know, were, were you the representative of the women in, in the executive mm -hmm. suite and this kind of thing? And now we have many strong women in the executive suites and as CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. But there is this generational thing. Now the question is, how do we support the, the first generation? That's yes. what it is. Yeah. Oh, that's yes. a whole different research. Yes. <laughs> that's a whole different research. Yes. Yeah. You have, you have an answer. Yeah, I have to admit it before I have to I have to run this class. Uh, my name is uh, Ina Dr. <laughs> in and I, um, I have been teaching uh, multicultural education classes uh, for Eastern Michigan University for several years. Yeah. So I'm, uh, you know, because I originally am from Russia, I'm international faculty, I experience very similar things, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like uh, African American, any minority groups experience. Yes. And uh, 
uh, I know that the very powerful in my classes was activity called the uh, privilege walk. Oh. Did you do that? No, but no, I did. Uh, is, yeah, I did the privilege share. Uh -huh. It is something that allow people to realize about the existence of privilege, white privilege in this society, yeah. not from the instructor, yeah. not from a lecture, but mm -hmm. from what they feel, mm -hmm. where they found themselves in the room physically, yes. you know, in front or on the back. Yes. So this is great uh, activity. It is very high risk activity because, mm -hmm. you know, people will feel not very comfortable, yes. very yes. uncomfortable, I would say. Yeah. But, um, you know, it is very powerful. Yes. I recommend to try. I will. Yeah. What, what I do in a classroom is I line up approximately like seven chairs and I tell seven volunteers to sit wherever they want to. And then I put a trash can right in the front of the first chair. I give them about five or six pieces of paper a piece and then the people towards the back they only get like one or two, three pieces. And then I just tell them to shoot the uh, paper into the basket. And then you notice at the end of the activity nobody helped another person out. No one said, hey, I'm right here at the front. Pass me your paper. I'll put it in the trash can for you. So that's also when we talk about privilege, I do the exact same thing. And then also it, it, it uh, fosters a rich discussion of if you have that privilege, you should be trying to utilize that to help other people come up too. Yeah, it was you. a good discussion. Uh, and another thing uh, before I leave, another thing uh, what I use in my <clears throat> like international business class or leadership class that I currently teach, um, I recently um, um, did my uh, DNA, mm -hmm. and I found that um, you know, like thirty something, thirty plus um, different nations. Yes. Uh, I have genes mm -hmm. from different places from around the world. Yes. And this is, uh, this information. I have a chart mm -hmm. that shows the percentage. And this, uh, this I, I develop activity. You know, I mean, I ask people like uh, who has uh, German. Yes. Uh, cheese, okay, the ground, uh, who has like uh, whatever. Yes. And I can actually connect myself with everyone in my classroom, yes. including African Americans, yes. because I have uh, um, North African cheese, yes. so I have Asian cheese, yes. I have, uh, you know, different type of cheese. Yes. <laughs> so this feels very well. So in, by doing this, I can say, okay, now we are not only, um, you know, like um, classroom fr friends or classroom uh, teaching and, uh, yes. and students, we are relatives. We're relatives. We are, uh, yes. You're my brother, you're my sister. Yes. So we are uh, related to each other. So this feels very well. Yes. <laughs> and I think that's also what we need to do is really communicate with each other, you know, not just department to department, because that is, I would have never known that had I not come to the final uh, supposed to. Oh, I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. It was great. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I think you're making a great point about when you go into an environment, you take an expectation with you. And when I first started working here as a professor, you know, so I came from a corporate environment. And when I came here, one of the first things I did is I went to the conference. And it was like, Christian business faculty and they had this flyer said, you know, that there were activities for yourselves. And I thought, wow, that would be really cool because I can train myself. I haven't done that, but I know a lot of the, the guys, they take their stops, you know. And so I looked into it, I inquired about the activities, and it was things like cake decorating. And I was like, wow. They, like, and when I got there, I kind of thought, wow, what am I going to, what's this conference going to be like? <laughs> and it was just exactly like what I thought, based on what they said this class's activities were. Mm -hmm. And so what I noticed, like Kimberly's talking about, you know, in business, I started to know, you know, I mean, you, you're more welcome, you know, you're, you're one of the few, but, you know, you start to be more welcome. But when I came into higher ed, I realized that it seemed a little bit behind. In that, in that, you know, the mindset was, if you were coming to this conference, your spouse was female, <laughs> yeah. you know, and um, and so once I knew that's what the spouse activities were, I was like, this is going to be a room full of men, and it was, and I, I felt invisible, you know, and it had been a, it had been a, year, a number of years, 
years before yes. I, I don't, you know, and so I can see what you're saying. Yeah. Because it's a really weird feeling, like you don't even, like you don't even exist or something. That, that was my experience, so I don't mean to keep that on you. I don't know. I mean, I felt the same way, you know, in our faculty meetings, I was very quiet, probably up until like three months ago. Um, but, you know, at the faculty meetings, it was just yes, no, I agree, and I walk out the door. Um, it was only one time uh, when I first started where I had an idea because I could tell that there was a problem with multicultural competence within the classroom. And I was, I, you know, I was like, hey, you know, we kind of need to change this form. It should have something with multicultural competence and it was shut down. Once that was shut down, I never said anything else again. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah. Now that was called the micro... Microaggression. Okay. Yes. Micro um, insults are when you just blatantly say the things in the classroom. That's far few and in, be in between, but the rest of them are, you know, you only got hired because you're black and they needed, you know, black female faculty. And, you know, it's hard going places and holding that with you because all institutions need black female faculty. You see, it's, we're only, what, 2%? So whenever you go somewhere, they're just like, oh, you're black and you're female, we'll hire you. I, I, I went to a conference and someone just offered me a job because they need black female faculty. You don't want to see my resume, you don't care about my research, you just, we need diversification. So it's also because the accrediting bodies are stressing this, everybody's like, we gotta go get it, we have to go get it, versus you know, being intentional and saying, you're the right fit for our organization. So yeah. That happens in other fields as well. Uh, someone who I graduated with um, and so in her social work classes, she uh, we had a speaker in chapel here on campus one day, and he um, he lived in Texas and had a church and he was looking to hire a position um, a social worker had a fit in that position and he walked up to her and said, Hey, I heard you're a social worker and she said, Yeah, because she said the chapel band so he's tired and she was like, I want to offer you a job. He's like, Do you, you don't know anything about me? He's like, You're a social worker. He's like, Yeah, I'm looking for people of different cultures, you're a social worker. So there you go. Because, yeah, just because she yeah. was black and he heard he was so social. So yes. That was the only criteria. He didn't care about her, he didn't care about anything else. It was just that. It was just that. And it's, it's like I said, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's difficult in a lot of different industries because even with grants, they want to know that. How are you doing? What are you doing? Multicultural company. I think that they're forcing it on people, but we're not dealing with the underlying issues. So you want diversification, and we all do, but we need to deal with the underlying issues. Let's talk about different things. And um, I was happy to join the diversity committee for the School of Human Services, so we, we started to bounce ideas off of each other on you know having open communication or having a support system. If it is a multicultural issue in the classroom and you don't know how to deal with it, you can come to the committee and we could possibly provide trainings or we could come in, in the classroom and assist or even observe and say, okay, don't tell me who the student is, but just sit back and you'll be able to pick up on some different things in the classroom. It's that support system and that connecting with each other. So we don't know how it's going to work, but we'll work it out. Before dealing with it and you're trying to deal with it in the classroom, what about the organizational culture within? University. So, what you're saying is, is before we bring it in the classroom, start with the faculty and the organizational structure. Um, well, yes, and do you feel like there's a lack of that, though? Um, do you think so? Yes, there are staff members that I think we all need multicultural competence training, and part of the training is first and informing, uh, because majority of the faculty we have. We're in academia, we have master's degrees, we have PhDs, so you're the smartest of the smart. But what comes after that? You learn your culture, and I'm pretty sure African Americans aren't the only ones that have to adjust themselves and change things about themselves to be within the culture. So I do think that it's an ongoing process because the thing with culture is always changing. You'll find different things about yourself, like we discussed in our classroom. I, I um, my whole life I already knew all the cultures I identified with, with German and black and you know, being a woman and even the military. Um, then I was diagnosed with hearing loss. So now I'm wearing hearing aids, so now I identify with a different culture. So your culture is always changing and you know, even just dealing with that, well, one day I could possibly be deaf. Or talking to the diversity committee and saying, hey, what now? How does this affect me, you know? Um, the only reason I told 
my employer is because I was told to tell my employer. I wasn't going to say, okay. They said, you know, the Disability Act, they have to know, but you don't want to get a faculty evaluation saying that you don't listen to people and really you can't hear. So they said, it's the career job. If they had not have told me that, I wouldn't have said it. So those are the type of things where if it's like this in my culture, it's like that in other people's culture. But it's that welcoming aspect. I want to hear. It was funny, I've gotten that twice in this week, and that's what I needed. Yeah, but yeah, the last couple of months, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> Any other questions, concerns? Thank you all. Specific recommendations, I think let's do some research. I really want to do some research. Let's look at faculty evaluations. And um, when we do mentoring, pair, you know, a black person with a black person. Uh, I know we want to do something different, but our experiences are a little bit the same. A woman with a woman. The person that I was paired with, she only helped me with graduating, which is a good thing. But as far as everything else in the classroom, she couldn't relate. So we really kind of fell off with the mentoring relationship and then following up with that mentoring relationship. But do some research. I think before any change, we need to see if we even need to make a change. Look at faculty evaluations. Look at, you know, first year um, or first generation full-time faculty and what their process was like and what can we go from there. Some research. But only after I finish my dissertation, we can do some research. <laughs> Um, I'm working on chapter four, so I finished interviewing my last person Monday, and now I, I was, it's qualitative, so I have to find things, ground and theory, find things, and use in vivo, and yeah, but I have two weeks off of school, so that means right, 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 right. right. Yes. Forgiveness therapy, which is funny, I spent my whole career on forgiveness, and then right towards the end of my dissertation, like I'm done with it, let's do multiculturalism. <laughs> so, yeah, forgiveness therapy, I was trying to, well, I've actually kind of done bridge the gap between Christian counseling techniques and secular counseling. So what, we're, what I found out thus far is we're doing the same thing, we call it different. So some people don't call it forgiveness, they call it acceptance. Or they use motivational interviewing to do the exact same thing. We just, in the Christian counseling realm, we say forgiveness therapy. 